Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is Gabriel Diaz. I'm the current chair of the English Language Studies Department here at the New School. And it's a thrill to have you back in our house uh, in one more of our public uh, workshops uh, that have been proving so successful. I mean, I keep seeing familiar faces over and over again. So thank you very much for returning. And it's a special privilege to be here tonight introducing somebody who is such an integral part of our master's program. Right? But before I go on to introduce our speaker tonight, I have a little quiz. Um, I'm going to say a few names, and I would like you to tell me what those names have in common. OK? Um, Bertrand Russell, Franz Boas, Margaret Mead. Do they ring a bell? Willa Cather, John Watson, Aaron Copland, Louis Mumford, Robert Frost, and Thomas Hart Benton. What do they have in common? <laughs> what? They're artists. They're artists of some kind. Writers, we have writers, we have philosophers, we have painters. They're all great thinkers. They're all great thinkers. They are leaders in the field, can we say that? And what they have in common is that they all taught here at the new school, when the new school started. In our first years as an institution devoted to adult education, this wonderful group of people were our faculty, right? And as we said, there were leaders in the field. Tonight, we have one of our current leaders in the field who's taking our master's program along the same path that these great thinkers took this university almost 100 years ago, right? So I would like to quote one of the people we're going to be hearing a lot from today in how he defines the relationship between a leader and the people that leader influences. Paulo Freire wrote that the trust of the people in the leaders reflects the confidence of the leaders in the people. And our speaker tonight has a lot of confidence in us. That is why we're all here. So join me in welcoming Scott Thornberry, please. Thank you, Gabrielle. I, that's very sweet of you. And you've done some of my work for me in terms of uh, situating this talk in this context. I'll return to that in a minute, but I just want to add a personal note that I first met Gabriel a year ago today in this very room uh, when he was over from Uruguay to, as part of the process of being recruited to take over the chair of our department, and it's wonderful sort of uh, symmetry to be, back, to be introduced by Gabriel, it's a certain, um, uh, I don't know what, poetry about it, so it's wonderful, thank you, that's very sweet and kind of you, it's, very, it's lovely to see you all this evening. Familiar faces, some less familiar, but I hope um, that we have a chance to. It's, it's uh, advertised as a discussion. Uh, it's a bit going to be a bit one-sided as a discussion for the first hour, uh, <laughs> but um, uh, we will throw it open and uh, invite questions, comments from the floor uh, when I've when I've done my bit, and then we can gravitate over to that end of the room if there's anything left. Uh, to oil the discussion further. So thank you very much for coming along on this very hot evening in New York. Um, it's, it's also, yes, as I said, Gabriel, in a sense, situated this talk very much in the context of this organization. Um, and, and that's what I want to do, really, today. I want to situate what we do as English language teaching professionals, those of, of you who are English language teaching professionals, within the sort of broader sphere of education, generally. And it's kind of apt, therefore, that this is taking p place in a university with such a wonderful reputation as the New School, um, in a building which, as Gabriel pointed out, has seen many illustrious thinkers and scholars pass through who are not necessarily connected with education. But it's, uh, I, love this, I love this part of New York because it's, we're surrounded by universities. And, and as I say, it's good to be reminded that we are educationalists, and we forget that, uh, I think, from time to time. Any, any field, start can, there's a danger of getting sort of tunnel vision 
uh, slightly blinkered. And for me, personally, this is a little bit of biography, but for me, I started to realize that English language teaching was situated in the broader field of education when I did my master's at, um, let's see if this works, at this place, which is the best photo I could get of it, uh, of the old building of the University of Reading in Britain. Uh, and I uh, did my master's in TESOL there. Uh, and we, one of the wonderful things about doing a, um, an MA on, on site, and I say this at my peril because I know a lot of you are doing the online MA, but it is great to be surrounded by books, <laughs> real books in a university. And uh, the University of Reading has an absolutely ginormous library, and that was great. Uh, but there was also a local library for the department, so there's what, which was called the, the Center of Applied Language Studies. So we had our own library specific to the, to the topic of English language teaching or language teaching. And that was a great library, and many of the books there were written by people who had contributed to the University of Reading's uh, strong, uh, I mean, it was strongly implicated in the development of the communicative approach, Reading, both Reading and the University of Lancaster. So it was great to be having have uh, access to both those libraries. There was a third library in Reading, which I didn't discover until sort of halfway through the course. And this is, I think, the picture of it. And it was actually housed in the original buildings uh, of Reading University, which is uh, some way away from the main new campus. And this was the library of the Faculty of Education. And I only discovered this relatively late. And it's a wonderful building apart from anything else. And it was stacked floor to ceiling with books, journals about education. And it really was, for me, it was like <gasps> the scales falling from my eyelids. I suddenly discovered this enormous wealth of literature about education in general, which I was completely, had been until that point, oblivious to. And this was really the great, the great excitement of doing that master's program and dipping into this wonderful rich seam of research and literature on the topic of education. So what I want to do really today is, is, is sort of take that theme and share it with you and look at uh, some of the kind of key educationalists that for me, I think, have been very important and maybe are less well known perhaps in our, as I say, rather sort of tunnel vision kind of field. Uh, and then we'll sort of draw some implications from that. My... Um, master's thesis, uh, dissertation that I did at Reading was on the subject of uh, reflection. In fact, what I was looking at was uh, teachers' reflections on their teaching as described in their learning diaries or journals. And I think it's now customary on many courses for, to ask trainee teachers, teachers and trainees, I know some of you have been doing that for me in the last month, to keep a journal of their... Uh, of their reflections on their classroom teaching and everything that feeds into that as a way. And of course, the name that's associated uh, inextricably with the concept of reflection, and I was kept coming back to again and again and again in my uh, researches on, in every bibliography where you find reflection, you find, of course, the name of John Dewey. And there's a certain serendipity in, in being able to uh, mention his name, of course, in these circumstances. Of course, as you well know, he wasn't on. Was he on your list, Gabriel? It would have given the game away, actually, yes. But John Dewey was one of the co-founders co of the new school. And he, although he returned to Uptown, to Columbia, subsequently, the new school for him throughout his life was, in a sense, a laboratory for all his... Uh, his educational, his more progressive educational work. I think he still had a very strong affiliation with the new school, even though he wasn't here uh, physically all the time. And of course, reflection was, is, is as I said, associated very much with the work of Dewey, uh, uh, the notion of the reflective practitioner uh, and of learning through experience, a various kind of ideas that we can associate now very much with this tradition that he, in a sense, over a hundred years ago, yes, over a hundred years ago, uh, initiated the idea that you learn through experience and by reflecting on that experience. Uh, and so uh, we associate um, comments like this, 
the notion that education is not preparation for living, but it's part of living. Uh, there is a seamless progression through education into living. It's through living that you learn and through learning that you live. And we associate, of course, with Dewey the concept of sort of constructivism, the notion of building on uh, what you already know and learning through experience. Uh, and these, this is going way back, 1897, talking about processes being, in a sense, uh, part of the cycle of learning uh, anything. These um, cyclical processes of experience and reflection and further experience, etc. And we see that, um, so these are the kind of concepts. This is one of my, I've talked about six big ideas. I'm sort of um, conflating these two ideas, but uh, uh, these are the, the, the buzzwords, if you like, that we associate, or I associate with Dewey, and that I think have a lot of relevance. And of course, we know um, how this has been realized subsequently. This is not Dewey's learning cycle. It's um, Kolb's, but it's very much a representation, a fair representation, I think, of, of Dewey's thinking, that you, you work through experiences, through reflection, conceptualizing or theorizing, if you like, and then planning for further experience. And this has been very much part of my experience as learning to teach, but also as a teacher trainer. I, I, was, I learned to teach uh, way back in uh, a, uh, an organization in London called International House. And this is a photo taken from a book from the 70s, I think, of a teaching practice class in International House where teaching with bottles of champagne then, uh, presumably countables and uncountables, <laughs> Barbara. Uh, uh, a more, more contemporary, and the, the thing about this, this course was, although it's sometimes been maligned as being very uh, both intensive and rapid, and nobody said so you can't learn to teach in just four weeks. In fact, it was incredibly hands-on, it was very experiential. From day one, you were thrown in at the deep end, as it were, into teaching practice classes, and you, uh, and that same model, in a sense, is what we have continued to do in one form or the other. This is, a, this is from the MAT so last summer, the teaching practice classes in action, where the same kind of collaborative teaching is going on with observation, feedback, etc. And it's a very powerful model of learning. And it's amazing the number of people who I have trained on those kinds of courses who come and say that was the most intense learning experience of my life. And these are people who have done masters, sometimes PhDs, and yet they said that one month of concentrated learning, because it was so deep-ended, and it was only subsequently that I realized, in fact, yes, this is experiential learning, you know, compacted into a very, very tight time frame. Um, and of course, it's also, uh, in a sense, if you think about it, the same principles underlie our view of learning a language or teaching a, a second language, teaching English as a second language, that it's best, and this, I suppose, in a sense, is a core principle of the communicative approach, that you learn the language by using the language. It's experiential learning all over again. And here's another nice photo from that same class last summer of you know, the classic information gap activity, the students at relatively low level, but engaging in inter communicative interaction and learning what it feels like to get their meanings across to a person on the other side of the piece of paper, doing the classic kind of, you know, guess who kind of activity. So this is very much, it seems to me, very, much, very consistent with these principles that Dewey laid down over 100 years ago. So that's, uh, that's my first, uh, if you like, my first uh, hero, um, the educationalist, as I say, outside of our field. The second one um, has been less well known in the West, but I think has now really uh, become as influential, if not more so, and that, of course, is Vygotsky. And I'm not going to insult your intelligence by telling you necessarily a lot about him, except I have to show you this. I found this in a second-hand bookshop in Boston this weekend, uh, which is a copy of Thought and Language. You can't actually see but very clearly, but there's the Russian, in Russian, in Cyril, is it Russian script, there's his name. Uh, and I, kind of, I, bought, I have a copy of this book already, but I had to buy one just for this cover. Um, and it's interesting also because this was published in 1962 at MIT, and you think, my God, P Vygotsky was translated. We say, oh, no, the reason why Vygotsky wasn't that well known is because he wasn't discovered until really basically after 1989 and when, when you know, Soviet th thinkers became respectable again, or Russian thinkers. But in fact, this was a translation that was done 
in, and published by MIT a long, long time ago. So he has been around, and in fact, those of you who worked in maybe mainstream education will be f will familiar with his uh, principles. But what I, what I found extremely exciting about uh, when I first sort of started reading up, more not reading Vygotsky in the original, but reading people about, writing about him and applying him to our own particular field, was the notion that learning is mediated. Uh, so it's not just the per, you know the the solitary Dewey esque person think doing and thinking and planning and doing again, but the wonderful thing about Vygotsky in theory is that it kind of situates socially situates learning, uh, which of course Dewey would never have it would have had no problem with. But it's this particular emphasis on mediation, which I think to me was was really quite suggestive. And so you get this typically, of course, when ch children learn skills for the first time, like riding a bike, where they, have, they do it through the mediation of somebody who is uh, a little bit better at them, more support, I mean, is supportive, in this case, the mother helping the child to, to, to ride the bike. And as you, you can see in the succession of photos, that as the child sort of builds up, uh, up speed, you get a, a real physical representation of how the mother's support is slowly withdrawn. And of course, this... Uh, is n and there you get, you know, I mean, that's a, a, a nice um, visualization of the process of scaffold, what we now call scaffolding, of course, where it's learn learning, the learner t is able to take risks within the, the framework of the support of other who's talking them through, showing them physically through how to learn a skill. And of course, we see this in language learning, uh, this process of first language learning, this process of other regulation. Uh, where the skills are modeled for you, if you like, by the better other, and these are internalized, and you are able eventually to regulate yourself. And as I say, this is realized nicely in first language acquisition. This is a conversation between a 20-month-year-old boy and his father, uh, and the boy's telling a story about something that happened at the zoo, and it goes like this. Try eat lid. The father says, what tried to eat the lid? Nigel repeats, try, eat, lid. What, try to eat the lid? Goat. Man said no. Goat, try, eat, lid. Man said no. Yeah? So you can see the father kind of drawing out the story. Uh, and so providing us, as you like, the kind of the, the safe framework for the child to explore a little bit further. And then later, after further, there he has a chance to talk to his mother, who seems more skillful at drawing him out than the father. Uh, <laughs> Nigel says, go try, eat, lid, man said no. Mother asked, you know, the best question in the world, why did the man say no? Goat shouldn't eat lid, shaking head. Good for it, mother. The goat shouldn't eat the lid, it's not good for it. She see what she's doing, she's reformulating what he's saying in nice grown-up language. Nigel says, go try, eat, lid, man said no. Good, goat shouldn't eat lid, good for it. And so <laughs> what you've got here then is the whole story. It's kind of been scaffolded for him through the... So the least leading questions of his parents. And then uh, Halliday adds, the story is then repeated as a whole verbatim at frequent intervals over the next few months. So he gets lots of chance to practice it. And, um, and so, again, here we have a, a great example of kind of mediated learning, socially situated learning, mediated by the caring others, as it were, scaffolding, whatever you want to call it. And uh, it's not insignificant. This is part of Michael Halliday's book, learning to mean, in which we laid down the foundations of the kind of, well, foundations. He developed the thinking that also fed into the communicative approach. Um, and we can see that in second language acquisition, and I think that's something that we try to cultivate in the classroom, especially in the conversations that we have with our learners in which we scaffold their developing second language ability. And we see it, of course, in the teaching of skills like reading, where reading is very much a process of jointly discovering the meaning where the better reader leads the less good reader through the, or into initial literacy. And I'm particularly interested in, therefore, uh, programs like the Reading Recovery Program. Are you familiar with this? You, you must be, people are nodding, yeah. Whereby reading uh, kids in their first language who are having difficulty with initial literacy are uh, supported through reading programs where they're given one-to-one -one help. And you see very much these Vygotskian principles working. Uh, and, um, and, there's a, and what I like about it is that uh, it doesn't deny the usefulness of 
uh, dipping down occasionally, if you like, into looking at how words are sounded out. But it doesn't start from the kind of phonics approach where everything has to be sounded out. So there's a sort of two-tier, if you like, or two gears operating. High gear, where the, the, the learner is reading comfortably, working on what they already know in context, etc. But when they hit a problem, they're encouraged to kind of drop down a gear, as it were, and engage with the, la the text at a more um, discrete level. Um, and here's a, this is a publicity video, but bear with me. I think although it's, it's, it's selling the notion, but I think it captures quite nicely some of the features of the reading recovery program if you don't already know it. And I think you'll see how kind of Vygotskyan it is. Okay, so you get the idea. And again, those of you who may be familiar with the program, but it seems to me that uh, and she mentioned one of the, mentioned the word scaffolding and passing, but it seems to me it's very good, again consistent with that close uh, relationship between the, the learner and the teacher, uh, and it's something that of course happens in other learning other skills too. Somebody told me about this book, and it may well have been somebody in this room a year ago, uh, a writing, a book about writing that came out in the 90s, uh, which takes the same. Are you familiar with this? Nobody familiar with this? Somebody told me about this, and I found it on Amazon, a book called the, At the Point of Need. And it describes a writing, pro, a writing program in a university in the States uh, where very much, again, the writing, and this is a mixture of uh, English language learners and native speakers in a university context learning academic writing. And it's, again, mediated in small groups where where the, learn the students are encouraged to just write. It's very much a process writing approach. And wherever they strike problems, these are addressed at the point of need. And I kind of like that, that, that phrase. I mean, I think in a sense, that's what it's all about. It's dealing with um, learners' difficulties and needs at the point of need. And it seems to me to map on quite nicely to the notion of the zone of proximal development, which, of course, is the Vygotskyan one. The concept of teaching only at the students' perceived points of need and as they arise depends on recognition of the power of the person's intention. So it does require the skill of the teacher to recognize what it is, to negotiate what it is, what the learner is trying to say, and help them say it in a way which is uh, successful and effective. Uh, at the point of need, too, seems to me to, ca to capture the notion of the, what, in a sense, what we're trying to do on our teaching practice classes in, um, in the, well, any kind of teaching practice, but in the, in the MAT salt, for example. And one of the things I've been experimenting with on the present course is this kind of workshopping, uh, as well as having the practicum classes, but having workshops within the, uh, the sessions where groups plan out a lesson and then kind of workshop it using their classmates as guinea pig students, you know, the kind of micro-teaching. And here's an example, if this works, this is, uh, uh, this is the result of a group have, planning out a presentation of used to. Yeah? And what you'll see is one of the group has elected one of their members to uh, model this presentation to the rest of the class. And then you'll see the instructor, who happens to be me, uh, <laughs> intervening sort of at the point of need. I've cut, I've edited it a little bit, but you'll get the feel of what's going on, I hope. So, uh, today we're going to be looking at the used to, the verb used to, and to describe changes in the uh, English language. So, looking at these pictures, you can see that used to is used to describe changes from one part of one slide to another one. For example, I used to be small, now I'm big. I used to have short hair, now I have long hair. So used to is, even though it is part of the past, it's used to uh, describe changes. For example, another one would be like, gas used to be $1.50, now it's $4.50. So it's the changes on the English language. Not particularly just staying in the past, but things that happen all the time that you no longer do. So if you used to have short hair, and now you, have long, now you have long hair, this is what currently is continuously happened, and this is just something that used to happen. <laughs> <laughs> and I can give the sentences. Okay, everyone, right. Okay, don't, don't move. 
you've got an ideal situation here, but I think you've given them too much information. So just try it again. We'll take out the words on the board and just rely on the pictures. And then we'll take out. This, and so now we're just working on the visual information. And uh, first of all, we need to establish the vocabulary. So ask them questions about those pictures to establish the vocabulary. So, what do you see in this picture? Good. <laughs> So you get the idea. Um, Marcus is not here, is he? No. Um, yeah, but this is I, this seems to me a very, very powerful way of teacher training because it's kind of low risk in the sense uh, it's it's being supported and modeled. It's, it's it's low risk in the sense they're not real students and therefore you, it's not so much at stake. But I do think there's a possibility of blending the two modes of tr of training, whereby you do use your teaching practice classes, your real ones, to have use them more workshoppy like this with the permission of the students. I don't think, uh, you know, there's, there's problems of the teachers losing face in front of the students and the colleagues, but I think it's something that I'm interested in exploring because I really do feel this is a very powerful model for learning anything. It's the kind of master class approach where you're working really close, or team teaching would be another one where you divide everybody up, buddy them off, and you work with a classmate and you teach together, and, and especially if the t you know, there's a difference in level and experience. Anyway. So that is, um, that's, uh, that's teacher training at the point of need. And so what I pull out of that, the Vygotsky and these principles, which uh, are <clears throat> the notion of assisted performance, although he never used that expression, but it's been used subsequently, that performance, assisted performance is how we learn. And that's exactly what I was doing with Marcos. Uh, and scaffolding, of course, which again wasn't a Vygotskyan term, but nevertheless is very much intimately associated with that socially mediated learning theory. Okay, who's number three? Ah, yes, okay. And Gabriel mentioned uh, Paolo Freire. And again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on Freire, but you'll be familiar that his work in the 50s, 60s, 70s in Brazil as a teacher of first language literacy uh, to what? Yeah, these were kind of adult 
uh, farm workers who were illiterate in Portuguese. And rather than using these, uh, the published um, primers of teaching reading that had been published and printed in wherever, Rio or whatever, he decided to abandon all that and just simply work with the mat raw material of the classroom, in a sense, to base the lessons very much on the content of these learners' lives. And he developed this pedagogy, which had strong, uh, political, a strong political agenda as well, a liberationist one, uh, which was founded very much on the principle of dialogue rather than transmission. So rather than I am the teacher and I'm going to transmit my knowledge to you, it's we're all in this together, and through dialogue we're going to co-construct your learning. And so in a sense it very, maps very nicely onto, onto John Dewey. Uh, and so he started originally teaching uh, uh, what they would call these culture circles where these farm workers would come in and volunteer teachers would, would use visual aids to sort of generate discussions to get them thinking and talking. And this became the, uh, a core principle in his teaching of literacy. Um, and he, as I said, uh, he kind of redefined the relationship between the teacher and the learner. The class is not a class in the traditional sense, but a meeting place where knowledge is sought and not where it is transmitted. And the, and the medium for doing that was through dialogue. Whoever enters into dialogue does so with someone about something. You know, once you make dialogue your pedagogy, you, you, have, you have to have something to talk about. And that something ought to constitute the new content of our proposed education. So what the learners, their own interests and needs, as they bring those to the room, that is, becomes the content uh, <clears throat> of the instructional process. And I, I find this very, again, very powerful. It's very consistent with what we now would call perhaps learner-centered learning, but it has a very strong, as I said, political agenda as well. And this, uh, to me, these two words are very, very, very uh, suggestive in terms of our own field of teaching second languages, giving, using dialogue to mediate the learning process, sort of changing the relationship between teacher and learner to a more symmetrical one, and by doing that, granting the learner some agency, some control or responsibility of the process. So I'm not going to go much further into that uh, because time's running out and we've still got three more to go. So now, one of my favorite uh, educations, and again, I apologize to those of you who may have seen uh, this little sequence before, but because she's so relatively little known in uh, this part of the world, I, I feel it's worth uh, sharing uh, my affection for Sylvia Ashton Warren. Of course, she's a New Zealander. And uh, she did work a little bit in North America and Canada towards the end of her life. But she, um, she comes, while she was working at the same period of time as Paolo Freire, she comes from a very different kind of tradition. She was a self-taught educationist. She never wanted to be a teacher. Her husband was a teacher or a headmaster of rural primary schools in New Zealand in the 1950s and 60s. So she, but was compelled to travel around with him and become the infant mistress, or what was called the infant mistress in those days. So she had to take care of the kiddies and teaching them uh, reading and writing in their first language. And she came up immediately against this problem that the books that they were using to teach reading and writing had been imported literally from the other side of the world. Uh, Janet and John, uh, the books that I, in fact, learned how to read and write, but they're very much uh, based upon the lives of small small, of course, small children, but middle class <laughs> white children who were brought in a British context. And she, this just didn't relate to rural New Zealand in the 1950s where the majority of the students were, in fact, from the uh, indigenous um, population of Maori. And so she developed a, a kind of self-taught herself a, a method of teaching reading, uh, which she called organic reading. And it basically revolved around, again, uh, this very, this Freirean principle, if you like, of working from what the children themselves wanted to express, using their lives to form the basis of teaching literacy at the word level first. So what she would do is on these cards, she would ask these kids individually what word would they like to learn for the, in advance of the next lesson. They'd tell her a word, she'd write it on the card, they would take the word away and always literally own the word and they would kind of bring these words back the next day and she would do things with them. What was interesting, of course, is the words that they 
uh, volunteered were not the words that you would associate typically with early literacy, like you know, jump and hop and aeroplane, but they were words like kiss and cuddle and drunk and knife and fight. I mean, they were very much words with strong emotional charges, and they came, of course, from their lived experience of, of living in this uh, context. And so there they are. Uh, these are photos from her book, uh, uh, <clears throat> Teacher, which is a kind of journal, and well worth getting hold of, if you can, a journal of her experience as she developed this approach. She also wrote novels uh, about this. Uh, she was a sort of a novelist monkey, and, uh, uh, and one of the novels was, in fact, turned into a Hollywood film starring Shirley MacLaine, of all people. <laughs> and it was set in California because they couldn't be bothered, obviously, moving the whole thing to New Zealand. I've never actually seen it, but I'd love to. It'd be very interesting. But here they are going around with their cards. And what they do with these words, once they've kind of, in a sense, owned them, is they're turned into sentences, these proto-stories, which they write up around the blackboards all around the room. And these stories are also very highly charged because, again, they represent their stories about their, their own experience. And so you get a story like this one. The number, I went to the river and I kissed Lily. I ran away. Then I kissed Philippa. Then I ran away and went for a swim. <laughs> yeah, the other one's not quite such fun. Our baby is dead. She was dead on Monday night when mummy got it. But you can see this is powerful stuff. This is powerful stuff for a five-year-old. So again, the principle is very much the same of giving the learners agency uh, and using the raw material of the classroom to construct knowledge uh, and first language literacy. And again, I don't have to draw the links between what we do and second language. It should be fairly obvious. And she said, and I thought this is really kind of a key comment. She said, she can't control the communication. It's like all over the place in the classroom. But she says, I harness the communication. She says, I can't control it, and I base my method on it. And this is said in 19, I mean, pre-1963, I think, with the notion of communication, grabbing the communication, using that to become the stuff, the content of the language learning or literacy learning experience. So these are the, again, not words that she would have used, so they're kind of more, more recent, but giving the students, the, or learners in this case, the, uh, the voice, allowing them, in a sense, to provide the content. And also the notion of this, what she called organic process, but what we might now call emergent language development. It kind of grows up, as it were, uh, almost um, uh, in a kind of um, a sort of, what's the word, emergent way, a self-organizing, uh, that's the word, a self-organizing way. And so and this is kind of, uh, those of you who are at Diane Larson Freeman's talk in this very room uh, earlier this year will know that that's a, a kind of buzzword. Okay, so that's um, Sylvia, and uh, let's move on now to, I don't know, are you familiar? This is the only one of my heroes that's still alive. Sugata Mitra, Indian uh, uh, researcher, educationalist. Are you familiar? No? Well, this is totally new. Oh, well, this, is, this will blow your mind. This is, now, <laughs> Sugata Mitra, I don't quite know what his background was or what prompted him to do this 10 years ago. But he's got enormous faith in the uh, learning capacities of children, particularly, which are unsupervised, unregulated, and are simply self-motivated. And to prove this, what he did was, in rural India, in villages, you will have heard of this, I'm sure, they put computers in holes in walls which are accessible to children. And with no instruction, these children who presumably had never seen a computer, let alone used one, uh, and they left the computers on and with sort of touch screens or whatever, and they said it was, and they monitored, they could monitor from behind us, as it were, uh, the way that these kids taught themselves from zero how to use these computers, how to do complicated uh, uh, operations like, you know, cutting and pasting and downloading and whatever uh, from zero with no adult mediation whatsoever, simply driven by their own innate capacity to solve problems. And so it was called the Hole in the Wall Project. And there you, there's the hole in the wall. And uh, uh, here's a little description of it. Uh, I have an edited CNN report. Uh, so again, we might want to dip the lights. Okay, now this project has continued. You can follow its progress on uh, 
online. Um, Sugata Mitra, are you familiar with the TED Talks uh, on YouTube? Well, these kind of 20-minute talks of experts around the world. If, you, if you're not, then he's, uh, you should be, because they're, they're wonderful presentations. And he does one about this project. And I will, by the way, make uh, a list of references available to you uh, after the talk. I meant to mention that. So what he, I mean, in a sense, you can say, well, how does this map onto the idea of uh, mediated learning? Who's mediating who? So in a sense, I guess it's a kind of peer mediation rather than teacher mediation, driven by this, 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 the motivation. I mean, that's key. And what he calls it is minimally invasive education, by analogy with minimally invasive surgery. You no, know? that kind of, you know, you go in through a keyhole kind of thing. And, I, and it's a kind of interesting metaphor that basically it's a kind of hands-off. Supply the tool, supply the motivation, and off they go. And, um, But it does assume that high degree of motivation. But I think the, it does, I mean, I like it in a sense because it places so much faith in the learner's ability to solve problems themselves, particularly in a um, collaborative uh, context. So there's the reference, uh, or just Google hole on the wall if you're interested in following up uh, how this project has developed and evolved over the years. But it's great fun. So. Uh, these are the concepts that I take away from Sugata Mitra is the notion of exploratory learning. So it's, again, it's exploratory experiential. It's, 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 it's consistent with John Dewey. And the notion of minimally invasive, hands-off kind of education. He actually, now he talks about, he, sets, <laughs> he talks about these problems he sets. He visits schools and he'll, he'll, he'll set them a problem, a tar, you know, It's like, okay, solve this. What if, blah, 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 something, you know, a science problem. It, what if you wanted to go to you know, the moon and you only had you know, X, Y, and Z. And, he'll, and he says, think about it. He says, I'm just going out for a bit. And he'll come back and visit the school six months later. <laughs> and he'll say, have you solved the problem? And they have. They have. They've been working away at it. But I like this. He says, well, I'm just going out for a bit. And then he disappears. Um, so that's the notion of minimally invasive education. Finally, is it finally? How many have we done? Five? Just let's run through them. Who was the first? Dewey, second, Vygotsky, Freire, Ashton Warner, and Sugata Mitra. Okay, the final one, I think, again, will be familiar to you. You will have heard of or have read the work of Neil Postman. Um, I first came across him, uh, he wrote a book in the 60s, or co-wrote a book called Teaching as a Subversive Activity. What a great title. Uh, and this was written, you know, I think, 67. It was a kind of important period when there was a lot of subversion going on and well needed. Uh, and he, he's a, how would you characterize Postman? I, he's a subversive and he's a sort of whistleblower. Uh, he's, um, he's a kind of maverick educationist who's the first to point a uh, suspicious finger at anything that's newfangled or being thrust upon teachers that wasn't of their own devising. And his, his particular uh, bugbear is the kind of willful, mindless, thoughtless imposition of technology into classrooms where it's not necessarily welcome, needed, or affordable. And uh, so he um, has, uh, his, I mean, his particular, um, uh, the quotation mo most often associated with him is, is the one about computers. This is, what is the what is the problem for which computers in classrooms are the solution? What is the problem? You know? And I think it's a good question to ask about any technology that's being introduced before there's been a, a felt need for it. You know, this, somebody comes along selling you an interactive whiteboard, but hang on, what is the, I don't have a problem with my old-fashioned blackboard. Uh, so, you know, that's the starting point. That's what, and here he is, let's see if we can, yeah. Okay, <laughs> you get a flavor for his, uh, his uh, cheeky, uh, almost insolent uh, take. But I think it's kind of refreshing to have somebody stand up and say, hang on, let's, let's think this through. And not just about technology, but anything that's being imposed upon us as teachers. Um, 
And he asks a number, in the same talk, he asks a number of questions, uh, which, which uh, including this one, which uh, I think are worth asking. If it is a problem, well, whose problem is it? Is it the teacher's problem, is it the learner's problem, or is it the administration's problem, is it the institution's problem? Um, suppose we solve this problem, what new problems might be created thereby? And you think again, of course, you don't have to think that far back uh, in the history of technology to see that we've actually created a lot of problems for some of these technologies. Think of, the, uh, think of antibiotics, for example. Think of the car, um, nuclear power stations, etc. It's, it's not as quite as, uh, the news is not always good. And then what sort of people and institutions acquire special economic power because of technological in innovation? A lot of talk at the moment about, for example, introducing language teaching or the delivery of language teaching through uh, uh, new technologies. We, we only have to think back, those of you who are as long in the tooth as I am, I was trained to use language laboratories when I was first started teaching. What happened to language laboratories? They kind of like, oh, behaviorism out, language laboratories out, all changed. They were sort of stripped down and turned into self-access centers. Uh, we've got the interactive whiteboard. Now, I mean, my lips are sealed. I've never used one, so I don't really know to what extent that they actually are an improvement on existing whiteboards. But uh, I'm very happy to be working in a smart classroom here in the new school. I find it a, a great resource. But I'm not so convinced that uh, the technology is value-free, if you like. There's probably negatives that we need to think about. Uh, and then mobile technology, which is now being <clears throat> fated as being the answer to language learning delivery. Everything's going to be, you know, reduced to the size of an app. Uh, where will, where will, who, who will benefit from that development? What other problems will it create, etc.? So, I mean, these are questions. That are, I'm very grateful to Neil Postman for raising these questions, and I think we need to be reminded of these questions. Uh, questions. It's interesting that um, Sergey Brin, who was the co-founder of Google, said, and this is this kind of belief, this, this kind of sort of almost religious belief in the power of information. As long as you've got information, that's all you need to solve all the world's problems. Um, and I think Postman, in fact, said it all when he said uh, in one of his writings, he said, if a nuclear holocaust should occur some <clears throat> in some place in the world, it will not happen because of insufficient information. If children are starving in Somalia, it's not because of ins inf insufficient information. If crime terrorizes our cities, marriages are breaking up, mental disorders are increasing, and children are being abused, none of this happens because of a lack of information. <clears throat> These things happen because we lack something else. It is a something else that is now the business of schools. So I think, again, this is a very powerful to be reminded. And this is, really is what education is all about. It's not simply delivering information. It's to do with something else. And whatever that something else is, uh, you can't Google it. <laughs> uh, so these are the things that I take away from uh, <clears throat> Neil Postman. This idea of problematizing the things that we take for granted and the notion of uh, the something else, the elusive something else. So that's it, my six kind of, if you like, um, educational gurus from outside our field. And let's just ex remind ourselves, these are the kind of concepts that uh, I've pulled out of their uh, thinking. And it's been a very much a kind of um, cook's tour of educational theory. Uh, the talk called Six Big Ideas and One Little One. <laughs> now, where I've lost the little one. It's so little. <laughs> Here's the little one. Um, <laughs> this is the little idea I just want to share with you. And because this talk is not being sponsored, and usually these talks, is, uh, this one is not, but usually these talks are sponsored by a publisher. But because this one is not being sponsored by a publisher, I can say whatever I like. Uh, <laughs> I want to tell you, I want to share with you something that happened to me about 10 years ago when uh, it, as a teacher trainer working um, with mostly in-service teachers, not dissimilar to what I'm doing now on the MAT Soul, I was becoming, me and my colleague uh, in, I, in International House Barcelona where we were working, becoming increasingly frustrated by the attempts of our trainees to sort of, it seemed, to subvert the training process by bringing into their classrooms, their practice lessons, piles and piles and piles and piles of material. 
So much material, in, in fact, that there was seen to be little room to do anything else except hand it out and collect it again. Um, so you'd see a teacher coming along the corridor for her 45-minute or 30-minute practice lesson, and she's carrying a pile of course books, and she's carrying a set of dictionaries, and she's got a whole lot of photocopied handouts, and she's got a box of Cuisinaire rods, Leslie, and she's got uh, <laughs> uh, a CD or two, and she's got a guitar, and you say to her, <laughs> Betty, it's only 30 minutes, and she says, yes, 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 I know, but just in case. <laughs> In case what? In case I run out. I say, look, Betty, if you run out, you can just, you know, maybe you could just talk to them. You know, have you heard? We're communicative approach. Have you heard of it? And she said, oh, no, I couldn't do that. Um, so uh, I, um, we were sort of frustrated by them. We became rather draconian as trainers, so saying to our, our, our trainee teachers, no, you can't, Betty, you can't put it away. You can take in the course book, maybe, or you can take in the dictionary, not the whole lot. Just make more of less, yeah? uh, and you'll be amazed and surprised and delighted what happens when you clear some of the space away in the resourceful classroom. What will happen? You will become more resourceful, and your students will become more resourceful. And sure enough, as we kind of created those spaces in the classroom, we noticed that there was more and more what we would like to think, real talk, real communication, authentic interaction occurring that before then had really been confined to the margins of the lesson. So this, uh, it was then that I uh, saw this film which came out around about the same time, a Danish film, uh, and it was part of a, a school of filmmaking which was known as Dogma, D-O-G-M-E, forgive the pronunciation of Scandinavian speakers, but that's the best I can do, which I think does mean dogma, but it's spelled with an E. And if you remember, do you, do you remember this film, those of you? Uh, who, it was a kind of like, pared down filmmaking, very anti-Hollywood, very anti-technology, very anti-big you know, special effects, big budget movies. And they created a manifesto in 1995, uh, which are, uh, these are a couple of other films that I don't know whether they passed your way, but they're kind of art house films, so definitely they were not big. But their, their, um, their manifesto included uh, the these, what they call vows, uh, that you had to swear to, um, to make a dogma film. And the first one being, shooting must be done on location. Props and sets must not be brought in. If a particular prop is necessary for the story, a location must be chosen where this prop is to be found. So if you want to make a film uh, and you need, you know, a flock of chickens, you can't just dial up, you know, rent a flock. You've got to go <laughs> to somewhere where the chickens are and you film it there kind of thing. And the other, another one was uh, the sound must never be produced apart from the images or vice versa. Music must not be used. This is, so and I, again, most music is, you know, it's, is laid on after the event. But if you want music in film, somebody's got to pick up a guitar and actually play the music. So you get these kind of rather grainy, rough films. It's all handheld. And, you know, but this, they, are, they did have a kind of impact. They were very memorable in this story. And it was what they called a rescue action. They wanted to rescue cinema back from Hollywood and back, put it in the hands of people who wanted to tell good stories. And so it had a kind of powerful effect. Now, I saw this film, and I was thinking, well, that's an interesting analogy. Isn't this a little bit what we're trying to do in our teacher training context, is trying to sort of rescue language teaching from what was becoming, even then, 2000, very, very resourced, if you like, over-resourced. Again, thinking in terms of Neil Postman's take on it, say, what is the problem for which all these resources are the solution? Especially given that we were paying lip service to the notion of a communicative approach, and surely communication means like people talking to each other? So I wrote this kind of facetious article um, called a Dogma for EFL in the year 2000. It came out in a, in a teacher's journal in Britain. And I got an immediate response. I'm sorry for those of you who have followed the story. Maybe some of you are actually uh, um, members of the discussion list, which was then formed. I got an immediate response. Yes, yeah, so we set up a discussion list on the internet. And basically, I was arguing that uh, Materials, as important as they are, are not necessarily the only route to the learners, or route, sorry. They are, uh, if you like, the sort of um, diversionary route. And the direct route between the teacher and the learners is one which, is th which we need to, to, 
to rehabilitate, if you like, through the kinds of activities where teachers talk to learners, learners talk to each other, and the communication is happening between the people in the room, and following kind of Freirean principles, the dialogue, the content of the lesson is in the dialogue. Uh, so uh, we started this discussion. Oh, yeah, then I wrote what were a sort of the, a kind of a parody of the vows for uh, the film movement. I said, this is what we've been trying to do in our particular context. So, for example, a, a director of studies of a school in London said, yes, 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 you know, the tyranny of the photocopier we're trying to. And a teacher in a school in Poland, they got in touch, et cetera, a teacher in Korea. And so we formed a discussion group on the Internet uh, which is still going 10, 11 years later and has clocked up something like 16 or 17,000 postings. Now, this is a completely emergent phenomenon. Talk about emergence. I had no intention of kind of starting anything. I just simply wrote a one-page article which was meant to kind of wake people up. But there was obviously a felt need for somebody to come along and say, hang on, you guys, we're kind of, we're, we're losing the plot here, almost literally. Uh, and hence this dogma. So this is the, this is what, uh, and this is the kind of, in, in the um, blurb that goes with the discussion list, and that's the address if you want to, if you don't know it already. Uh, uh, we're looking for ways of exploiting the learning opportunities offered by the raw material of the classroom. That is the language that emerges from the needs, interests, concerns, and desires of the people in the room. That's the starting point. It doesn't exclude the use of materials, but the starting point is yeah, so that's a little idea. Um, and this is just to give you a flavor of some of the stuff that comes up on the discussion list. This was earlier this year, a teacher in France. And you don't have to subscribe. I mean, it's like, a free, you, I think you have to subscribe to be able to post, but I mean, it's completely free and open. And he said, <clears throat> this is Phil in France. I have no idea what kind of context he's working in, but he says, I'm a new dogma man, I've been experimenting. I've been doing materials for your discussions followed by language focus. Am I doing the dog a bit right? Cheers. <laughs> so somebody's, and this is the marvelous thing about this community, and it's the marvelous thing about the internet in a sense, which is ironic because in a sense it's the technology that's made dogma uh, become a kind of a global community of fellow practitioners. Rob, who is in the States, says, thank you for sharing this class with me. I feel uncomfortable telling you whether you're doing dogma right, but I can say... Materials for your discussion followed by learners generating notes for themselves seems dogmatic indeed, and so on, and gives some tips. So you get, you know, so that was like literally the same day. Phil gets a response. And then uh, Mark in Japan says, the beautiful thing about dogma to me is that it can enable students to speak from their hearts, creating meaningful discourse. As the students say, what happens to the immersion language happens, which in turn brings about teachable moments. So you've got Mark chipping in saying, yeah, yeah, Phil, you know, it's good, it's okay. Phil then, uh, a bit later on that week, says, cheers, we're hopeful. my dogma revolution is firmly underway this week. And he noticed, I also noticed that my discussion circles ended up in completely different topics at the end. When we did it together, as I'm nudging and poking, and perhaps supporting the path of conversation that moved into years, this seems a very hard skill, and to the initial stage, too much correction can kill it. So, you know, teachers grappling with real classroom problems, of how to kind of give the students some of the, uh, the flaws that were, how to deal with correction, which after all, you know, the responsibility without killing the conversation. And then, uh, where are we now? Two days later, thanks for all your comments and tips. I've managed to survive a quite enjoyed dogmatic-ish week. It's the first time I've seen students actually interested in giving their own true opinions. The best feedback I've had is that one student comes early for class and now says it's the first time he's ever been allowed to speak properly. And it's a kind of, you know, I mean, I pull that one sort of out of the hat, but there's a lot of these nice feel-good stories there on that discussion list of people experimenting with, for them, what is a different way of teaching. Uh, and it's been given permission to do it. And I think that's the thing particularly about dogma. It wasn't like necessarily it was a new idea, but it was like by branding it, by giving it a name, in a sense, gave people permission to experiment with it. Stephen Krashen says that. He says there's no new ideas. There's just new labels for old ideas. And that really is the point because... Uh, why is dogma a small idea? It's a small idea for three reasons. First of all, because it was never intended to be a big idea. It was just a, an analogy which caught on. But importantly, because it built very much on the, it, it, on the work of these, in a sense, it was consistent with educational theory, progressive educational theory, going way back over 100 years. Uh, and in a sense, I only discovered that in a, retrospectively, 
to a large extent, but these six education is very much what their notions of education seem to me to be support and vindicate the approach that my little idea, which was the dogma one, that's me. Um, and there they are, those, those big ideas, if you like, which I think, as I say, are completely consistent with the dogma philosophy. So if this is new to you, then I'm delighted. Uh, if it's not, then uh, thank you for bearing with me. I, um, uh, and as I say, the website uh, still, the discussion is still, uh, is still there, although it has kind of, with blogging now, uh, the focus has kind of been more dispersed, and you have to follow this number of people who blog regularly about lessons that they are doing within this kind of paradigm, if you, if you like. And uh, it's kind of fun to see. It's almost like a second generation of teachers have discovered this, this notion and are, are finding it liberating. So here is the, uh, my website with the references uh, to some of the texts that I've mentioned if you're not familiar with them. And on that note, I'd like to thank you for your attention to this first part of the evening. And now I invite comments and questions from the floor. Thank you. And there are, thank you. We have some time for questions. Because we're being filmed, we want to capture this for <laughs> posterity. So. I noticed you used the term educationalist as compared to educator. And um, ah. maybe I should know the difference. I haven't been in school in a long time. Um, can you tell me what difference you perceive? Or? Um, well, I'm, as Neil Postman says, I've never been asked that one before. And I haven't actually thought about it. Now you've made me self-conscious. <laughs> I, I don't know. Does anybody distinguish? I, I think if I were, were, I think perhaps what I'm getting at is people who write about and theorize about education. Uh, so those would be the educationalists, the more academic, whereas the educators are what, what we are, essentially, teachers. Etc. But I'm not sure if that's a distinction that's in the literature. I wasn't even conscious that I was making a distinction, but it's a good one. I mean, it's a good one to, to, to follow up. I can't answer. <laughs> yes, Charlie. Context. Um, I'd like to answer it if I can. Uh, one is uh, terminology, the other jargon. Mm -hmm. What are you asking, Joe? That's I'm answering. Sorry. Oh, I see. That's the answer. Well, okay. Oh, so you, educationalist is jargon. Well, I thought that you would say that. <laughs> There's no such thing as jargon within a professional field. It's all terminology. Well, it's only for outsiders. Is that your perspective? <laughs> Is that your perspective? You liked it. I like to think of myself as an educationalist, perhaps, uh -huh. but I, I wasn't. I kind of thought maybe it meant you teach and do other things. You might write, you might uh, do art, or, you know, share, Possibly, yeah. teach language through some activities, or. I, I, I'll I, have to do a. Jargon a, has a negative connotation, <laughs> I think. Well, I'm a teacher, and from my perspective, uh -huh. uh, somebody who wasn't a teacher and wasn't, uh, I di didn't uh, believe themselves to be a progressive mm -hmm. educator, mm -hmm. such as me, I call it jargon. Mm -hmm. Okay, fair enough. That's I'll, from the ESL, I'll... of uh, from the, the dictionary of ESL. Uh -huh. So it's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> There's another... This looks like a relay, right? Yes. <laughs> You know, I listened to your ideas and I thought these are the ideas we try so hard to embrace in many IEPs in the United States. Mm -hmm. When I read about what happens in public schools in New York, I get so upset mm -hmm. because I feel everything is completely the opposite. Mm -hmm. Teaching to a test, mm -hmm. imposing on teachers mm -hmm. lessons that they must do, judging teachers by what their students accomplish based on some artificial test. What can you do to help this problem? Because I do think it's a problem. I think it'll hurt the children in this country. It'll hurt this country. And I really wish that education programs could somehow transmit these ideas beyond their students who are teaching in 
programs around the world and in the United States that seem to embrace them. Yes, no, very good point. Actually, I meant to preface the whole talk, and I'd forgot to say that, to make that very point, that education is such a, a burning issue. But then again, I think, well, when has it never not been a burning issue? Uh, that we get this polarization between, if you like, the headmistress and the, you know, and the, the, the progressives as represented by Maggie Smith. Uh, I think the healthy thing about what's going on in the States is that it is such an open debate. Uh, I mean, you can't open a newspaper now without reading. Did you see the New York Times, for example, on Sunday, there was a sequence of letters in response to uh, Diane Ravitch's response to David Brooks' piece in the New York Times, etc. So it's, it's, and it's absolutely fascinating. And I don't know anywhere else in the world where it's so out front, the, the argumentation. If, you, if you're on Twitter, for example, uh, you can follow Diane Ravitch, are you familiar with what you're saying? I mean, she's out there militating, and she posts about 20 times a day, uh, and it's a connection with that. What's very interesting is that people from our own field, like Stephen Krashen in California, has embraced the cause of, uh, of reading recovery and reading programs, and, and not only that, they're recognizing the role that social circumstances, poverty particularly, plays in education and how it's not all to do with, you know, charter schools and increasing grade results, etc., simply through handpicking the students and all this stuff. I find it absolutely fascinating what's going on here. So in a sense, to answer your question, I think what we just have to keep talking about it and writing about it and discussing and doing exactly that. And I think there is a sort of, I, I get a feeling that such a strong groundswell of opinion away from this testing mania that something will crack eventually. And, uh, and I think the analogies are that being drawn with countries like, for example, Finland, which have got this, you know, the best educational system in the world and where there's no standardized testing. And people are really sort of starting to say, well, maybe we sh should be looking, looking outside to see what's going on. So I think there's some very healthy developments in this debate, but I recognize that if you're actually working in it, it's incredibly frustrating. I was talking to a a kindergarten teacher in the weekend teaching five-year-olds, and she says, we have to test them three or four times every month or whatever. And she says, the time that's taken up in this testing procedure when you could actually be teaching them things. So yeah, I take your point. Yes, next. Hi. Camilla. <laughs> Oops. Uh, just following uh, on my colleague's comments mm -hmm. in there, um, I, I am very much in favor of the dogma and I tried it many times in my classroom. It was wonderful. Mm -hmm. My only concern, and I guess uh, question, because mm -hmm. I don't think I have the experience with it, is with follow-up, extension, and independent learning. So I can see how it works in a collaborative mm -hmm. and communicative mm -hmm. context of the classroom, mm -hmm. but how do you um, apply that mm -hmm. to the extension? What do you send them home with? Mm -hmm. And um, and again, you, you've mentioned the, the testing and the assessment. And in, for instance, for many of us, we do have to contend with the mm -hmm. assessments that are imposed on our students mm -hmm. to get out of a program or to get out of the certain level. How does that tie in? Yeah, good, two good questions. Let me just address the first, Camilla. I think one of the things that, in a sense, has liberated us as teachers now is technology in the sense that a lot of the stuff that we used to have to do in the classroom, they can actually do outside the classroom and probably do it better. And I'm thinking of the kind of mechanical stuff, the kind of grammar exercises and stuff. There's now fun, sexy DVDs and programs and games, et cetera, where they can kind of, so it's just a matter of maybe pointing them in that direction to do stuff out of the classroom and reserve the classroom for the kind of fun group, you know, interactive stuff. Uh, similarly with listenings and that, there's no limit now to what they can actually download and listen to with, with transcripts and also there's some fabulous programs out there which provide uh, stuff. They've got online dictionaries, they've got online grammars, there's also, so, you know, it's, it, it's training them to use those resources. And I'm thinking, thinking in terms of an EFL context where they don't have access to English outside the classroom, but I think equally here, uh, it, that's the follow through in a sense. So it's not, it's really sort of saying dogma is not about not using technology. It's just saying maybe we could keep a little quiet space in classrooms for what classrooms are really good at, which is people talking to each other, but use the resources that are available outside the classroom for doing all that follow through. Does that kind of sort of address the question? 
Uh, well, I mean, teacher directed in the sense that teachers or teacher train, trains the students where to look, gives them websites and things like that. But then also encourages students to go outside and bring stuff back. So, you know, you're interested in this, research it, bring in a text, present it to your trainer, make a PowerPoint, do whatever. But, you know, so that the, 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 the classroom is the place where, uh, where students regroup to present the findings of their extramural researches. I think that's something that's worth considering. Um, and the second question, yes, about exams, well, I mean, <laughs> one of the things that the dogma uh, movement of whatever it's called has always been emphatic about is it's very, has, it has to be context sensitive. It's not saying, it's not a method that's trying to impose. Uh, it's very anti-method in that sense. It's saying in every context you will have your particular constraints uh, and you've got to learn to, you know, you've got to deal with those. That'd be institutional, social, cultural, political. Uh, exams, of course, are one of the biggest constraints on our lives as teachers, and we have to learn how to kind of accommodate those. But we also have a fair amount of autonomy, even so, as teachers. Once the door is closed, we can do more or less often what we like. And I think it's taking advantage of, of moments where things really do arise naturally. I think these will probably be the moments that the students remember best and may even feed into their... Uh, their overall proficiency, which will help them through the exam. I mean, I don't know, but I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest that you learn vocabulary, which, for example, which has strong emotive, affective associations. Now, just like those kids in Sylvia Ashton Warners with a cuddle, kiss, drunk, knife kind of vocabulary, it's that vocabulary that's generated by other people in the room. This is more likely to be remembered than vocabulary that was generated by a course book or whatever. And therefore, uh, this can only do them good. If you have a very rich classroom environment, lots of language flying around, then they have to go away with something that they'll remember and be able to reuse. That's my story. <laughs> yes, um, Sonia has a question. Scott, thank you very much. Thank you, Sonia. I find, I, I really appreciate what you've done and what you've said to us tonight. And for me, just being in the classroom with a textbook that it, that's been given to us and students not relating to it and then looking for material that will turn the student on. And I find that I am like a scavenger. I'm always trying to find material mm -hmm. that will make it, that will engage the students in conversation and connect it to their lives. And... Um, I'm, it's, to me, I'm still on that journey, but in the, in, in the process of the journey, I will continue to be a scavenger <laughs> as I get my material to make the class uh -huh. relevant uh -huh. to their lives. I mean, well, then I would suggest now maybe go one step further and turn the students, I mean, related to what I, my response to Carmela, turn the students into scavengers as well and send them out to scavenge and see what they can bring back. <laughs> yes, thank, you. thank you, Sonia. Any more before we... One yes. last question. Gabriel. One last oh, question. Oh, I thought it was you. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> oh, me? Yes, I did sort of, yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm, I'm very curious about... Um, you mentioned Sylvia Ashton Warner, mm -hmm. and she had written a novel or something. There was a film that was based on her experience with the Maori children, which that her experience sounded so immediate that I'm really interested in, in the name of the film, if you have it. Uh, I can't remember the name of the film, and I'm not, I think it'd be very difficult to get, but I tell you, the novel is called Spinster. Oh, uh, interesting. And, which dates it. Um, I like it. <laughs> and, uh, it's easy to find. Yeah. and as Sonia says, I would, you know, Google it. Um, <laughs> The film stars Shirley MacLaine and uh, somebody else. And, but I, 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 it's probably awful. But <laughs> it's not. The film? No? Oh, you've seen oh really? It. Ah. Well, you, there, oh, I met somebody you know. who's seen it. Uh, wow. Well, there you go. Um, yeah, so I'm encouraged. I don't know that I like the ending. I can't remember. Uh -huh. The sadness, maybe overnight. Yes, exactly. I think, yeah. She was, she herself 
there's a very good biography of Sylvia Ashton Warner too, again, which uh, is a good read because it sort of weaves in her personal story, and it's very difficult to disentangle her personal story from her professional story. The two are intimately involved and fed each other. And it, you know, it's a, it's, it is a sad story in some respects because she was never really, she was a prophet um, without honor in a sense. It took a long time before people recognized her worth, um, not complicated by her difficult personality. I mean, complicated by her difficult personality. But yeah, that's interesting. So Spencer is the book. She wrote a number of other novels. They're all out of print, but you'll find them in the Strand or somewhere if you look in second-hand bookshops okay. uh, or Google okay. Amazon. Uh, Google Amazon? No. Uh, sorry, John Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> but she, but please, whatever you do, read Teacher, because Teacher is the journal of her, uh, this discovery process, and it's incredibly readable. It's not, it's, it's the work of nonfiction that she wrote, but it's almost like, it's as good, if not better than her fiction. It's a wonderful read, and I think it's, if it's not still in print, it's still, it's easily, uh, it's easily found. Okay, well, again, thank you so much for coming along. It's wonderful to uh, see you all again, and I hope to see you again next year, if not sooner. So thank you, and thank you, Gabriel. Thank you.